Hey everyone, Benji and Igor here from the Contractor Evolution Studio. So you, my friends, all have a silent business partner in the room, one that extracts their share of profits every single year. And that is, of course, in Canada, the CRA, and in America, the IRS. Now, as a successful business owner, I'm sure that you've realized by now that you definitely add your fair share to the societal pot every year. And yes, it takes a lot to run the country. And of course, we all do need to contribute. But what most entrepreneurs don't really realize is that tax law is not at all black and white. There is a ton of strategy and a ton of planning that can and should go into your uh, annual accounting cycle. Right. Now, all too often, what we see are entrepreneurs following overly simplistic rules of thumb. Uh, maybe they've picked up some advice from, from family and friends, but it's totally outdated or way worse, just being totally uninformed about how the whole system works. This can, and more often than not, does lead to some serious oh shit moments, right? Um, an unexpectedly high amount owing or the dreaded visit from an auditor. Now, there's a huge difference between what I'd call like your typical accountant and a true proper tax advisor and tax strategist. And as your business grows and the complexity of your life expands, it becomes crucial to have the right level of expertise by your side. Uh, this is going to help you both stay out of trouble, which is very easy to, to get into trouble the bigger your business is. And it also minimizes your long-term tax outlay, which compounds your investable assets over the long haul. Now, our guest on Contractor Evolution today, Ben Dixon, is a partner at Renaissance Group, a CPA firm here in Vancouver, BC. And Ben has been in the business for almost 20 years, and he's directly consulted hundreds of companies and has made a niche for himself working with large contractors. So with Ben, today we talk about three common areas of accounting and tax strategy that business owners, they don't often understand very well and don't discuss nearly enough with their accountants. So things like corporate structures, holding companies, and how to set yourself up for long-term tax efficiency. Uh, we talk about how to figure out every year how much to pay yourself strategically and also how to decide the best approach for acquiring new vehicles, new equipment, that whole age old question of whether to lease or to buy. Before we get going, though, a couple important notes. So first, Ben Dixon is a Canadian, as we're filming here in Vancouver, BC. The specifics of what we talk about are geared towards Canadian business owners uh, and Canadian tax strategy. So if you're American, like a lot of our listeners are, these concepts are still really valuable, uh, obviously, for the principles that we open up. But you should definitely talk to your accountant about how they apply to you within the context of U.S. tax law. Second, remember that this is a podcast. If you're going to go base your whole accounting decision making solely on this show, you probably deserve to lose some money. Take your biggest takeaways from the episode, call your accountant, go for a beer and discuss how these principles apply to your business and your future plans. So let's chat tax strategy with Ben Dixon. You're watching Contractor Evolution, where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school, and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Ben, thanks for coming on the show, man. Right Excited on. to see you. Thanks for having me. Cool. Okay. I'm going to dive right into a question. This comes up, um, not all the time, but, but enough that I thought it would be worth running by you. Every once in a while in Breakthrough Academy, we, we meet entrepreneurs, contractors that are in some level of hot water with CRA or IRS. They either owe back taxes, they're getting audited right now, or, they're, or it's, it's looking like they're going to. And um, from your experience, from your reps doing this, like, how does that happen? Is is it a breakdown in the communication or mistakes made? Like, why does this seem to come up um, with some frequency? Well, I mean, I think the, the accounting and bookkeeping will usually take a back seat in the first years. Entrepreneurs are doing everything they can to make the business work. And, uh, you know, I think they there's a misconception that it, you can just get it caught up once you're ready. Right. And uh, for anyone that's run their own business, I think they know you never really are done and ready and you know have that free time it just something consumes that time and and people it gets away from them so it's not uncommon to come in and say you know if I've, I've got you know I incorporated three years ago I wasn't making a lot of money off the beginning so I didn't think taxes were going to be an issue mm. 
And, you know, a lot of um, reporting deadlines and uh, compliance penalties are, are time-based. So even though you might not have owed the taxes because your profits were, you know, you're in the early days, you're still going to get penalties um, or audits triggered. And these audits, they just come over and they consume your time and they take up so much more time than it would have if you were kind of, you know, on the game um, from the beginning. So I think that's that's one of the main reasons. And, and the second is, you know, uh, that complacency to engage with, you know, uh, maybe your uh, friend who's a bookkeeper, right? <laughs> or, you know, an accountant that, you know, you, you play hockey or baseball with. Your mom, your mom, your aunt. It, it's, yeah. very, it's very common. You know, yeah. a lot of people, we, we see that. And it's then, you know, not only are you working with someone that maybe doesn't have the expertise and they're, they're trying, but they don't have the expertise that's necessary, but it's a very awkward time to actually talk to them and say, look, it's time to, our business has grown, we've outgrown you and we need to enter a new thing. And and that will cause another further delay just because it's an awkward conversation. So a lot of times when we see people come in, it's, it's backdated filings. And the reason was something like that. Um, So, you know, I think, uh, you know, again, starting off your business, you want to save costs. That's normal. You know, I think, especially in the early days, um, and with, you know, with your advisors, the old adage of, you know, you, you get what you pay for, I, th- I think is, is really true. Mm. Mm. Right. That, I, I think there's, um, some lo- some disconnect. P- people seem somewhat uninformed with what good looks like with an accountant, with a bookkeeper. Um, it's sort of just like a, a box to check and they maybe don't see that there are, um, levels to it. There's different uh, you know, there's different levels of customer service. There's different levels of expertise, of education, of certification. Um, they're, they're not all made equal. So for someone that's maybe tr- um, looking for a really good bookkeeper, looking for a really, really strong accountant, can you maybe speak to uh, what a pro looks like? Like, are there telltale signs of this is a great relationship? I know this guy or this girl is like, you know, looking after my numbers, they're looking after me, and I feel super, super confident with with this person in my corner. Is there some, um, yeah, telltale signs? I think referrals are are the number one way, right? Um, speak to people in in your industry. Having an organization where you can lean on other uh, people in your industry and asking them who they work with and if they're satisfied is, I think, is the best start. But then after that, really, you know, having a candid conversation with your with your advisor and say, look what am I engaging you to do? Because the bare minimum for uh, an accountant in a typical engagement when they say, you know, this is my price is, is compliance. And what compliance means is that they're going to file tax returns. For mm. you, right. So they're going to grab information that your bookkeeper has assembled or, you know, the, maybe their firm will also do the bookkeeping. They're going to take that. They're going to complete your return based on that information. So, you know, in that, they're really not, you know, usually that's three, four months after that information has already occurred. Yeah. The events that l- led to those transactions occurred. So it's not really an opportunity for a lot of advisory. They can certainly have a year in meeting with you and say, look, you know, these results are maybe a little bit different than other clients in your similar industry and, and, and give you some feedback. But it really is a compliance driven exercise. And that is, you know, that is the bare bones. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you feel like you are missing something or you have a misconception that your accountant is also your trusted advisor and you're not providing an opportunity to meet with that client mid-year yeah um you know and and stay in touch and stay informed it's almost impossible to provide you know good advice um you know again accountants are always looking at things that happen behind retroactively retroactively right so i think that's that's really kind of the most common complaints when we we have clients come over to our firm we really do try and get an understand of what their pain points were before because they're they may be coming from a firm where i know technically they were they were quite competent they they knew the rules they filed the tax returns correctly but there was really no planning and advanced planning and i think with with especially with taxes you can't get rid of taxes they've you know they've come up with a lot of ways where if you do this it it applies it's there it, it is certain yeah right <laughs> but you can plan your taxes and you can plan to mitigate them as best possible. And when you're doing things in hindsight or trying to catch up, a lot of those options are gone. They're off the table. And all you can do now is become compliant. So, you know, where where I see probably number one complaints is not that the tax number is so big, is that it was a surprise. Mm. And I think in our business is that there's really no reason for it to be a surprise. 
Um, some of our, you know, our, our best clients we meet with very regularly, whether it's, you know, I always say my, my cheapest hourly rate is a beer and, um, and that's, that's the truth or a lunch. And we sit down and there's no agenda aside from just learning what's going on. And you'd be surprised in, in the small talk of what the client's talking about their, their plans. And it could be, you know, a, a change in their marital situation. It could be an investment opportunity they're looking at. It could be some staffing issues that what that trig- triggers into the next kind of set of planning that is done before the year end. So I think that's a, that's a real big difference between a good relationship and a bad relationship is if it's just compliance driven, it is what it is. Yeah. Um, but an advisory role really is a little more involved. L- looks, looks quite different. They're, they're, they're doing a lot more for you. And I, and I think, um, I mean, we're, we're going to address this throughout this conversation today, but that, that is the thing I, I want listeners to take away is, is it is not a simple black and white box that you check where it's like, I know he's got it. She's got it. It's all good. We're good. It's that sort of like the sounds people make before you have one of these, Oh shit moments two or three years later. And it's like, no, 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 they didn't got it. And you were in serious deep water now. And and I, I hope, I hope that that's one of the, the, um, things that people take from this and, and know to ask better questions, know to get referrals, know to get second second opinions and, and what have you. Yeah. I just want to highlight the, the really key point that Ben made. And it was a couple of minutes ago, Benji, when you were asking about how people get themselves into trouble. Um, there is such a big distinction there um, between different types, different levels of accountants and advisor. And, and, and it's not so dissimilar in other professional services, whether it's legal, investment advice, whatever. Um, yeah, there's depending on the size of your business, you have different needs and you almost graduate through different levels of accountants. So like the accountant that, you know, I, and I've had this before and you're totally right, Ben, people want to avoid that awkward conversation, but the accountant, the very simple reporting requirements that you needed out of your accountant in the first a uh, year or two, it may be fine at that point, but when a business grows, the level of advisory service that you need also needs to grow, right? Like Ben, you and I met a couple of years, let's say, into Breakthrough Academy. It wasn't at the very beginning, and and I had to have that awkward conversation. I remember that, and I can see why people don't do it. But that is the reality, right? As the business grows and the complexity of what you're dealing with grows, you as a as a business leader need to be cognizant of that, and you it's on it's your responsibility to go find the advisor that is at that level. And actually, as a matter of fact, I even have that going on right now on the legal side, right? Like it's, it's, it, as you get into more complex scenarios, you need, you need people that can, that can deal with that. And, and I just want to also, before we move on, I want to highlight the other point that Ben made, cause it is so important. I, I know it's a friend of mine for me are these reporting deadlines, right? There's reporting deadlines, there's installment deadlines. Um, it is your responsibility to know what they are and you use your, your accountant for guidance, but absolutely that is a thing in business. You're you don't get a notification on your phone saying, totally. dang, we need, you know, report this, yeah. pay that. That's yeah. your responsibility. If you're an adult, yeah. you're a business owner, it's your responsibility. So I want to, I just, I want to, I wanted to really highlight those two points. They're very important. Now, um, on the note of higher level advisory, the way that I like to look at it is there's a difference between a basic accountant who does just the filing and a real advisor, a tax strategist and advisor. Um, Ben, let's get into kind of three very common, very important concepts that 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 are that become relevant when you start to look at your accountant like a real advisor, a tax strategist. Because yes, there's a tax code, the IRS. There's a law in there, the CRA. There's a law in there, but within there, there is creativity. There's strategizing. There's future planning. Um, I want to talk about these kind of three three big things that you tend to talk about with with your clients on an advisory level. The first one being corporate structure, holding companies. Um, why do business owners need to critically be looking at their corporate structure and where they're headed? What are the purpose of these holding companies? I know sometimes I hear from people there, these, um, you know, people will say, well, do I get to write off more stuff or pay less taxes if I have holding companies? Is that a myth? Can you, can you unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah, the, the, the myth of I get incorporated because I can write off more is a, is a common one, and it's, it's absolutely not true. The, the, the Tax Act allows for deductions against income, and whether you're a sole proprietor, mm-hmm. which is an un- unincorporated you know, business owner, or a corporation, a deduction is a deduction, mm. yep. right? And that's, that's certainly not true. Um, the other you know, kind of myth is that taxes are lower for corporations, and that is partially true, right? Um, and, and to to 
talk about that further. You need to understand the the deferral advantage. And this I'm leaning in towards the Canadian tax mm-hmm. side of things because I know with the U.S. Um, uh, corporate corporate structures, there's there's various different types: C corps, mm-hmm. S corps, LLCs. And I'm I'm not the guy to speak to that. But in in Canada, you know, being able to understand that there's really two worlds um, of tax: there's the corporate world mm-hmm. and the personal world. And the corporate world, you know, its tax rates in Canada right now range anywhere from 10% to 30%. 30%. That first 10% is on your first half million of, of, of uh, profit. So if you can pay 10% or 30%, you're a, a corporate tax and you're able to retain the balance in your company. That means you're hanging on from anywhere from 90 cents to 70 cents on the dollar in your company. After that corporate tax. After that corporate tax. Yeah. And, you know, that can be a very powerful thing if your your goal and your objective is to retain cash, pay, maybe build up retained earnings. Maybe it is to hire more people, buy that piece of equipment, you know, that you've been looking at. Maybe service some debt that you have in your company from startup costs. Maybe you're mm-hmm. carrying a line of credit with the bank. And when you're able to extinguish that or invest at 90 cents on the dollar, that's a very, very powerful uh, tool as opposed to a sole proprietor who only has the personal world mm. and they're hitting 50% quite quickly. As soon as they're making a couple hundred thousand dollars of profit, they're at 50, 53 and a half percent in, in Vancouver. Yeah. Because as a sole proprietor, that money flows down right to you That's at right. your personal level. And the personal taxes are the ones that are significantly higher. That's right. There's right. no, there's no ability to delay. So if you can keep as much money in that corporate world, you're winning the corporate game. So a lot of people say, mm-hmm. why do I incorporate? And, and, you know, there's certainly, you know, some, some very good reasons of why you would want to incorporate one being your lawyer says you should for some legal liability reasons. That's, that's certainly, you know, fair enough. The, the other being, uh, this, you know, potential deferral and I, I call it the deferral advantage. Um, now that really only works, you know, and the next question is, okay, why, but when, Mm-hmm. When do I incorporate? And we get this question a lot. And a lot of people, and this kind of the, the third myth is that I should incorporate once I make $250,000, right? Or I should incorporate it 150. And that's not true. The answer is when you are saving that much money, totally. not making it, right? So, yeah. you know, we, we way too often will have, you know, a young business owner come in. He's had an amazing three, four years. He's hitting it out of the park. And he wants to incorporate now to take advantage of some opportunities, but he's developed this high cost lifestyle that he's loving because he's, right. you know, he's, he's, he's kicking it. Right. So he's re- doing really well. And he wants to, he wants to buy the boats, buy the condo, take the trips and live hard. And he's mm-hmm. really not putting much away. So by him incorporating, unless he had a, a legal reason to do it, a liability reason, there's no benefit. Totally. So, you know, for them, they can wait as opposed to maybe his, you know, his business partner who's, live in a lot more of a more modest lifestyle. Maybe his spouse, you know, earns a, a fair income and that can cover a lot of that house, you know, the, the life costs. Then it can be a really good time for them. Right. right. Yeah. So just to, to kind of outline this very simply for listeners. So you have this, you can almost think of this as this intermediary where the profits flow through and stay there where you can defer them at that level before flowing them down to you. And the purpose is really to save money, essentially to bank money in there so that it can compound and grow uh, at a much faster rate because you put more cents on the dollar there than if you got it to your personal level, right? Exactly. We're, yeah. we're never escaping that personal tax level. It's going to happen whether you pull it out to buy the house 10 years later or, you know, a, a lot of people, their holding company is their investment vehicle. So they build up, you know, large retained earnings in their, in their corporate world. And they know that when they retire, they're going to start drawing that down over time. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and yeah. similar to an RSP or a, totally. You know, a, yeah. So if I want to, if I'm in living in Kelowna, Benji, and I live by the lake and I just want to get that super sweet wake setter, no way to avoid that tax consequence personally, you got to pay it. Right. But uh, I, just, I just business expense one. Is, is that, was that a bad idea? <laughs> Probably not so good. Um, but, uh, but if I do want to save money, this is where that powerful investment tool comes into place, right? Because if I'm invested intelligently and I'm making averaging 12, 13% a year, if I do that inside of a corporation, like a holding company, where I have way more cents on the dollar, so I can maybe do it at 88 cents on the dollar instead of 55, 
because I'm not getting it to my personal level. It's sitting at the, at the, at the holding company level or at the corporate level. That money grown 10 years out, Ben, that's probably a pretty big difference. Compound interest 10 years out, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. Right. And, you know, I, I, I think the best example is when people have, you know, they've built up a lot of corporate cash and they're able to shift it to a, uh, you know, a, we usually recommend get it out of the operating company and into a holding company, but keep it in the corporate world. Um, and if you were to then buy a rental property with a mortgage, mm-hmm. you're able to service that rental mortgage with those corporate dollars. Totally. Right. We're keeping it in the corporate world and we're serving some of that down and, and you're able to knock that mortgage down that much faster. So it's, it's an incredibly powerful tool. I think it's it, in my world, that's the number one reason a lot of professionals and, and business owners um, and contractors become incorporated aside from the liability aspect. Right. I want to highlight you, you mentioned a really important point there. So if I have, so I have an operating company, I run a construction company, which is incorporated. I can move, I can retain profit there after corporate income tax before getting that personal income tax hit. So I can leave it there, but I want to buy, I'm buying a fourplex. I'm buying a bunch of Amazon and Intel stock and whatever it might be. Uh, why is it not smart to, to, to buy that real estate and those securities in that operating company? Right. So, yeah, that's a great question. There's a couple really big reasons. One being that your operating business is in business. It, it's exposed to a lot of risks in its day-to-day mm-hmm. operations. These can be contract risks, employee risks are, 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 are everywhere. Um, and if somebody was to come and take a run at you and, you know, launch a lawsuit against your company, what you don't want sitting on your company's balance sheet is, you know, these your investment real in Bitcoin and or your, whatever, yeah. you know, you, you're, these things that they're going to want to go after. If they look at it and say, oh, do you know what, this is just a lean, mean business, we hope. And, and pushing those funds up to a holding company, and if structured properly, that can go tax-free from operating company to mm-hmm. holding company. Mm-hmm. It's staying in the corporate world. Um, that... It's just one more layer of protection. And, you know, I'm not going to comment on the legal side, and it's not bulletproof, but it does provide a, a good layer of protection and separation between your holding company and your operating company. So that's that's really one big one. And the the last reason, you know, that people incorporate, and I kind of skipped that, was that you plan to sell your business one day. Right. Right. And, and in Canada, there's an incentive. If you sell the shares of a private company, that your first $900,000 right now with the capital gain when you sell is tax-free. Right. And there's ways to multiply that, but it's a very, very, you know, good incentive. You know, that's today worth about 225000 of taxes on a, on a sale for every nine hundred you shelter. So part of the rules that would qualify for that is that your company that you're selling does not have a bunch of excess non-business, non-active assets. Totally. Yeah. So, you know, your investment in, you know, a portfolio, too much cash in the company, if you're sitting on cash reserves, that's going to put that, that company offside and, and take away that $900,000 lifetime capital totally. gains exemption. So Yeah. So just to recap, so you want to keep your operating company nice and clean. This is just your operations that sit there. Uh, you don't pack a ton of these retained earnings and you don't hoard money in there. What you do, you move it out to a holding company. The holding company is where uh, investments sit, securities, real estate, all this kind of stuff. You compound it at a much more efficient rate in there because you're paying less tax to get it there rather than to you personally. So you invest at that corporate level, but not inside your operating company, correct? Absolutely. And there's, I think there's one thing to add there is that, you know, why do people not move money out of their operating company? Why do they sit on a large mm. retained earnings? And a, a question says, look, I've had a great year, two great years. I've built up this large reserve. Should I move it up to my holding company? I, I don't have a holding company yet. Do I need one? Um, and if what we just talked about was yes, then I think it's a good idea. But you do need to think about what is the impact of moving that cash? And a lot of people, especially when they're in growth mode, um, mm. they get caught off guard by future cash flow dips. Hmm. When they first started off, these dips were a lot smaller. Maybe their line of credit could cover it or their credit card or the shareholder totally. could cover it, and it wasn't a big deal. But as they grow, these dips can become bigger and bigger. You take on a bigger contract. The time between when you incur the costs and salaries and then eventually getting paid is longer. It still makes sense to do the job, but there's a delay in cash. And you, you do want to look forward. Is that going to impact me? Um, the other big one is, do you have any banking or bonding covenants? A lot of our contractors are subject to, you know, banking uh, 
uh, lending covenants, and then as well for bonding. Mm -hmm. And these covenants require that you keep so much equity in the company. In the operating in company. In the operating company, right. right? They need to have so much there, and they need to have so much of it to be current or liquid, right? And that's just the bank or the bonding company saying, look, you can't run that tight. Yeah. You know, we, we need you to leave some behind. So you do want to have that conversation as well. Right, and kind of find what your low water mark is. And that's a lot of times what we do with our clients. We say, look, what is our low water mark? And we can instruct their controller to move or, you know, their, their management to move any excess cash above that up the chain. Yeah. Another, another one um, I hear a lot of is um, people, uh, well, I, I'm curious whether you think this is good, good advice or not, but it's like, hey, you know, the, the business made X, whatever the number is, but I pay myself $36,000 a year and my, my, you know, my, my wife or my partner, my husband also works in the business part-time, you know, I, we pay them $20,000 a year. Like they, they're, um, terrified to pay themselves anything, you know, we would consider a, a livable wage for the business, uh, that they're running. Is that, is that smart? And most like, cause most people sort of say that like, it's a very, very strategic move. I'm doing it on purpose. I'm wondering if there's, if there's more to it than just like pay yourself as little as possible for as long as possible. I mean, yes, yes and no. Right. So we, we talked about the, the real deferral advantage where you leave as much income and retained earnings in your corporate world. And then anything you take out to the personal world is really try and just only take what you need. Now, the, the way the tax rate system works for personal is it's gradual. So it's just a, you know, an arc where, mm -hmm. you know, your first $20,000 or so of personal income is taxed at a very low rate. Your next 20000 at a little bit higher. And once you get up to about $200,000, now you're paying that highest rate. So, you know, would it make sense to pay yourself 40000 a year for the first four years and then all of a sudden pay yourself $200,000? No, not. absolutely not. It, you, you're going to be way farther ahead if you were to smooth that personal mm -hmm. income reporting over. Right. Um, and it, you know, it, it kind of gives me a, you know, it takes me to a lot of times what we have is we have a very successful contracting business and we have two shareholders, 50, 50 business owners. Um, one of them has, you know, the, the four daughters takes big vacations. Mm. His, his wife's a homemaker. Um, he's got a 30,000 a month burn. All right. So that means he needs to pay himself about 50. So after tax, He's got 30 left over, which is, you know, 600,000 a year right. type of income. His business partner, on the other hand, no kids, modest lifestyle. Um, he only needs about 10. And so, you know, the guy that's taken 10, he's winning the tax game. He's going to continue to build his holding company retained earnings. And then when he retires, he's going to bleed that out over time. Right. Right. And again, a nice smoothing of income. That all sounds really good until... The guy that's taking 10 goes to apply for a mortgage, right? And, you know, I think we've seen this time and time again where you go to the bank and you say, look, my, my operating company's killing it. My holding company's flush with cash. I want a $2 million mortgage. Or in Vancouver, I need a $4 million mortgage. Um, and the bank kind of says, yeah, well, you've paid yourself $100,000 a year, 36000 a year. Like, uh, sorry. Doesn't work like Doesn't that. Doesn't work. Yeah. And you say, what do I do? And you say, well, we're judging off your last two years of average income. So you need to go back and give yourself a massive dividend, pay that big tax rate, put a big down payment on and bridge the gap. That's one option. The other but to get that down payment, you got to draw a huge money yeah, at a high tax rate. At a super high rate. You, right. you know, you, you want a million, you got to pull two. Totally. Right. So, you know, that's not a great result either. So. Well, I think you, you want to try and win that game, this advisory piece where you start talking about, look, I'm thinking of possibly buying a significant piece of real estate in two years. Let's talk to the accountant. Let's work backwards at exactly what you do need to pull to meet that threshold. Right? Totally. And smooth that income the, over. And that's this is why this is why there's so much value in working with a pro like you, Ben. Um and I think w what I want people to hear is like, try to avoid these like overly simplistic rules of thumb where it's just totally. like, well, if this, then that. Pay That's yourself the logic. Less. 
and you're gonna, in the long run you'll be it. better and it's like yeah. that could be the case but it also may not be and it really dis- depends on your circumstances your desires and goals in life and i think that's why it's so powerful because this is all very gray it's all very it's all very sophisticated and complex and you do need help navigating it um so yeah av- avoid those like very very oversimplified rules of thumb and actually work with someone to devise a plan that makes sense for your life for your goals for your income for your business 100 right and that's the difference between an accountant who's just a true accountant and is doing the reporting requirements once a year for you and a true advisor on the tax side where you're planning and strategizing in the future. Um, one important point I want to come back to there though, Ben, is around this. We talked about income smoothing. We talked about some of these, let's say like the example of mortgage, which is a really common one where it's that second business partner that maybe doesn't have as high of a burn rate, uh, but could get in trouble when, when they, when they need to get lending one day. Um, now income, like reporting income doesn't have to equal cash moves though, right? If you can take advantage of, let's say $120,000 relatively good income, personal income tax rate as compared to having to go to 200s year after year later, um, you can declare it, but not move the money right away, right? No, absolutely. And that's a, it's very commonplace, especially in growth times where cash flow is so key. You know, if we're looking and we have a, a shareholder, an owner that says, look, I need to report a couple hundred thousand dollars. I really only need, you know, half of that. Well, just take the half. You build up a shareholder loan. The bank looks at that as equity on your on your balance sheet um, and just leave the money in the company. And then you can totally. pull it once the cash flow is available and you've already paid tax on mm-hmm. it. So you build this kind of tax-free shareholder credit that you're able to draw on then. Um, and that's a, like you said, it's a, it's a really good point of, of trying to manage the cash flow versus the income reporting. And and it, it is always, you know, I think another very common concept we always come across is is income versus capital. Income is what you report. Totally. Capital is the hard cash. Yeah. And they are not always timed the same. Yeah, exactly. And I remember like year after year, I've, you know, you and I would have those conversations again. Okay, maybe I don't need this level of personal income, but the way that I look at it is, okay, well, I'm getting a bit of a deal on it right now, huh. right? Because right. if I can report it at a reasonable level, even if, if I don't need it, I know that maybe with more kids and all this stuff one day the lifestyle will get more expensive but then i've built a bit of this buffer but you can't retroactively do it right you got to do it each year yeah totally yeah really really good point so we've talked about corporate structures holding companies that hold deferral advantage and the importance of strategizing on that that's number one we've talked about that important question of every year okay how much do i pay myself and i want to talk about one more kind of key thing which is a very common question we see and, uh, and some maybe these misconceptions. So how do I report and how do I acquire assets, right? We're buying real estate, we're buying an excavator, other big tools, we're buying more F450s, whatever it might be. You know, the common myth is it's always better to lease stuff. Is that true? Is it not? How do you, how do we figure out how we acquire these kind of assets into our business? Yeah, it's, it's certainly one of our more common questions from our, um, from our contractor clients that no matter what size you're always acquiring equipment um, or, you know, or the next piece of land. And um, like I say, no matter how big you grow, your the numbers just get bigger. Um, and I think it, the first thing is thinking that it's a tax motivated decision. And uh, in, in my view, tax really is third or fourth. Mm-hmm. Number one is cash flow, right? So if I'm able to, enter into a financing arrangement and I have, you know, maybe I have the cash in my company to buy this equipment outright. Um, you know, that could be a very short sighted move. If six months from now, I'm going to push myself into a real tight cash crunch. I know there's a little bit of interest that's involved in, in borrowing, leasing or financing equipment, but at what cost are you going to put yourself into a pinch? So if, if, if I have the cash and my cash flow is proven that I'm okay to, to, to spend it. Okay. That, that, that makes sense, right? But I think what, you know, the next piece is, is going leasing versus financing. And prior to, you know, prior to a few years ago, a lease was, uh, it was a rental of a piece of equipment with a pretty mm-hmm. large buyout. Um, but because of that, they would give you a, a lower monthly rate. Mm-hmm. So, so leases were typically a lot friendlier on the cash flow. Hmm. In, in most cases. And financing. And financing, right? Where they say, look, you know, it's a million dollar piece, five years, simple payments. Now, financing companies are 
coming to the table and they're introducing balloon payments at the end. So they can structure a payment structure that looks just like a lease. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. So I think that's kind of getting thrown out the door. You know, after that, you might want to consider the, the implicit rates that they're giving you and everything else. Um, but other practical considerations, um, a piece of equipment, for example, that you're not going to use that hard. And we see it quite a bit, especially in contracting. They'll buy a large fleet to, to, for a project. And that project mm. is maybe only a year or two old. And after the two years, the equipment is still in pretty good shape. And if they were leasing it, they've lost, right? The leasing company is assuming, it's no different than renting a car on vacation. If you only drive it for 10 minutes. They don't care. They don't care. They're happy, but that's right. their win. So I think you've got to be very you know, honest with yourself about how much you're going to utilize that piece of equipment. And if you are going to be gentle on it, you can buy it, right? And buy it and then, and then sell it and, and take some upside back. Third is really is what kind of impact it's going to have on your balance sheet. Mm. And I think this is a really big one that um, gets overlooked um, is that if you buy a piece of equipment, whether you buy it for cash or you take a loan, the impact on your balance sheet for a million dollars, you got a million dollars of property and equipment, and then you either have a million dollars of cash out the door or a million dollar bank loan of debt, Mm. right? And if you've got a reporting covenant to your bonding or banking on debt to equity, the equipment and the debt don't offset each other. Totally. We've, we've put ourselves in a, in a in potentially a tight spot versus a, a lease that's structured as an operating lease, and it's a bit of an accounting assumption, but the fine, the lease dealers are getting very good at setting these up in this manner, is that an operating lease doesn't actually go on your balance sheet. There's common that you may have a little note disclosure that refers to page 46 that, where they highlight that the company is has the following leases, but it in most cases, is not going to throw your existing debt structures out of the window, right? Mm. Or, or, or throw your covenants yeah. offside. So I've got a million dollars of machinery, but all that's coming up is just the, the regular expense Absolutely. that I'm paying on the lease. I'm not actually housing it on my balance sheet. That's right. So you have a right. you have a commitment, but you don't have it. It's not your asset, right? Right. Yeah. And that that can be a very very big one for a lot of people, and they they think of that kind of last, where I think it should be close to f- first or second. The, the fourth one being the taxes. And to be honest, the tax treatment on a purchase versus a lease is, is going to be the same in the end in a lot right. of cases. It's just that a lease gives you a nice smoothing effect of, of deductions and write-off. The lease payments are deductible. Whereas a purchase, you're going to get a higher write-off in the earlier years, and then it's going to decline over time. Totally. Mm, right. that's, that's really interesting because I, I think one thing that I've seen is actually some fairly frivolous, I'll even say harebrained like purchases of big fancy tractors, you know, cool new trucks, new, new stuff for the business. And, and, um, people have convinced themselves that it's some sort of tax strategy when it's really just like, you want a new truck, man. Like, let's be real. Yeah. You're saying that's like that, you know, that's actually like the fourth or fifth thing on the list that you would maybe consider. And even then it's not, it's not a major piece. There's way more important things to look at than, Oh, you know, I, I, we had a good year this year, but we posted a big net profit. I better go spend it on some, on some stuff. Yeah, because, I mean, like we said, the ta- corporate tax rate's anywhere from 10 to 30% in, in Canada. So what that means is if I'm a small business, I just started out and I went and bought the, the $100,000 pickup, it's a 10% write-off. I'm still paying 90 grand hard right. cash after tax write-offs. For that <laughs> write-offs truck. does not mean free. Right. <laughs> right. So, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm still out of pocket. So, you know, I, I think you, there's certainly um, incentives out there right now. There's, you know, the, a lot of especially with infrastructure and some of these COVID reliefs and they're trying to stimulate things, they are putting incentives for people to buy a piece of, you know, big yellow equipment or, or certain, um, you know, electric cars for, for business. And that, that might make sense, right? But you got to look at that on a state by state or province by province basis. Yeah, totally. So that, so that kind of classic question, Hey Ben, quick two minutes, what should I do? Uh, Lease, lease or buy? Um, It it sounds like there are, it really does depend on your specific situations. There's a number of considerations here, the balance sheet considerations, the cash flow considerations, taxes that are on there, but they're, they're further down the list. So every situation is specific um, to your business and, and where you're currently at and where you're headed, all the more importance for having a smart tax advisor. So it's good. Yeah. So this is great. So we've talked about, about corporate structures and, and, and why they're important and why this whole deferral mechanism is important. We talked about considerations of, of how much you, you might pay yourself and how, and, and how to acquire, acquire equipment all the way through. Um, this is why it's important to have a regular kind of 
a very open conversation. Like I know with you and I, like I can literally call you anytime, which is, which, which is awesome. Um, I want to close off on this one point. Here's another very common misconception. Benji, I think you hear this all the yeah. time too, which is, um, Hey, I've, I've gotten this awesome, like really great piece of advice from my accountant. They think we're in really good shape or here's what they think we should do. Um, what's your take on that, Ben? Like, are, are you really, like, are you properly looking at where business is at operationally, their strategy, where they should be headed? Um, what, what's, what's your guys' take on that whole approach? It's not, it's certainly not part of the typical service offering by an accountant, mm-hmm. right? I think, I think there are some great advisors out there and they will, you know, dive deep on these certain questions and, and provide some, you know, some good guidance and, and kind of, I, I say, you know, external CFO type services, but that is not your typical scenario, right? Um, realizing that the accountant is, you know, you got to think of how much time they're actually being involved in your business. And, you know, it, it's not a lot in a given year. So how, how, you know, how well can they know and how, what are your mm-hmm. expectations being met on, on that? And I think that's where it is, that discussion of understanding, which, what am I engaging you to do every year, mm-hmm. right? A lot, a lot of accountant firms are starting to offer these additional advisory services, but they are additional, right? Um, and thinking that it's just kind of wrapped in or it's going to happen is, it, it's just not realistic. So I think a lot of accountants want to do that type of work. Mm-hmm. Um, but unless they're engaged to, or uh, the client takes kind of the driver's seat on, on helping that, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard. So, um, you know, certainly uh, the business owner is going to know the business better than the accountant, hands down. Totally. So they, they, they do need to drive their own bus, but no, no one to ask for help. Yeah, 100%. So it's, um, yeah, I think it's important to realize that an accountant is looking retroactively as to like what has happened in the past, right? And they're able to analyze and give you some thoughts based on that. But it's really your responsibility to be thinking through strategy, operational plans moving forward um, and and explaining that to your accountant so that you can together devise the right strategic moves moving forward. Yeah, awesome. And, you know, to to finish on that, I think a, a very useful, you know, you use of an accountant would be a somewhat regular meeting where they show you how to read your own internal financials that you're getting from the bookkeeper. Meet with the bookkeeper as well. Play devil's advocate. Ask some questions um, rather than just once a year. See if, what you can do about getting those dialed up. But then also challenge them to prepare a forward-looking cash flow. Totally. Right? Because like we said, cash and expense are two different things. I can land a you know, a really big contract. Mm-hmm have to outlay for my salaries and my expenses up front and not get paid for four months later. Mm-hmm. Happens Ca- all the time. An income statement's going to show a great story. A cash mm-hmm. flow statement's going to show the gap. Totally. Right? And, that's, and that's, I think, a, a really big piece. Yeah, we talk a lot about this in, in the Breakthrough Academy program. Like literally within the BTA management system, we've got sections on proper budgeting, financial management, and there's totally separate than set than very specific focus sessions on cash flow management, two totally different things. And as a business owner, you got to understand both. But I love it, Ben. I love what you're saying around um, me with your accountant often, have these kind of conversations and with your bookkeeper too. The importance, uh, we've talked about this in other episodes, the importance of regular monthly financial reviews with your bookkeeper and this kind of close relationship with, with your accountant. So I think for all listeners, if you're kind of, if you're listening to this or watching this and saying, wow, I kind of talk to my accountant once a year for 45 minutes, I hope this is a cue for you to Kind of reevaluate that and say long term, like, is this is this really like the right thing, or, and do I need a higher level of, of of strategic guidance? Are you serious about your business or not? So that's awesome, Ben. It's been a great conversation, man. Thank you so that's much nice. for thanks th- thanks so much for coming on, uh, talking about a couple of these these all important points uh, with us. If people want to uh, chat with you, get some thoughts, tax strategy, uh, corporate structure strategy, where can they find you? Uh, rgroup.ca, so it's renaissance group, but rgroup.ca is the best way to find my email, contact information's all on there. Awesome. And on LinkedIn, LinkedIn, I'm on there, Ben Dixon. Awesome. D-I-X. D-I-X-O-N, that's right. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Hey, if you enjoyed this show, hit that subscribe button. It's what allows us to produce more awesome content for you totally for free.